February 12, 2016 signals the release of Deadpool, the highly anticipated Fox movie based on the infamous Marvel character. The history of Deadpool on film makes for an interesting case study of Fox Studios' interference in the Marvel-based movies. While the 2016 movie largely gave the filmmakers the freedom to do what they wanted, Deadpool's previous outing in X-Men Origins Wolverine was one of the most micromanaged movies ever to be released with a Marvel logo attached to it. In this video, we'll take a look back at Marvel's troubled past at Fox Studios, the main architect behind that trouble, and how the new Deadpool movie finally wound up getting made after all. It is easy to point the finger at the director when a movie fails, but more often than not, the decisions that turn movies that could have been great into disasters are in whole or in part made by the nameless executives behind the scenes whose names might not even appear in the credits. While directors and maybe even actors' careers may be adversely affected by a movie bombing, the executives behind the scenes can and often do point fingers elsewhere and continue to put their stamp on other movies another day. One such person is Tom Rothman, a former Fox executive whose creative interference on genre movies in general and Marvel-based movies in particular was so notorious that his name permeated its way into the mainstream. Rothman served as co-chairman and CEO at Fox from 2001 until 2012. Some of his greatest hits are said to include the canceling of Firefly, mandating that the movie adaptation of Alien vs. Predator be rated PG-13 and be set on contemporary Earth, a stark contrast to the Dark Horse comic, which served as the original source material, which was set in space after the events of the Alien movies. As far as the Marvel movies are concerned, he is said to have demanded that 2003's Daredevil have more CGI so it would look more like Spider-Man, and a shorter running time to accommodate more screenings. He is also said to have rejected future Ant-Man director Peyton Reed's excellent take on the Fantastic Four. He is also said to be the one who mandated Galactus be a cloud for the same reason he nixed the Sentinels in the X-Men movies. He thought that audiences would reject giant robots. Furthermore, the 2015 reboot of the Fantastic Four was greenlit on Tom Rothman's watch and Josh Trank was hired to direct with his approval. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. It was in 2005, while X-Men 3 was in development, that fans at large became aware of Rothman and just how rotten things were behind the scenes at Fox. What first made this knowledge more widely available to the public, rather than those directly involved with the film, was an open letter from Moriarty at Ain't It Cool News to Tom Rothman and Fox shareholders. The letter was published in early 2005 at the Ain't It Cool News website. Keep in mind that at the time it was written, Brian Singer had left X-Men 3 to do Superman Returns for Warner Brothers. 2005's Fantastic Four had not yet been released, and Marvel Studios and the Marvel Cinematic Universe was still but a gleam in Kevin Feige's eyes. The story for X-Men 3 was not yet known to the public, but Ain't It Cool News had gotten a hold of the script, and that is what inspired this open letter. Some excerpts read as follows. When I call Rothman a villain, I'm well aware of how loaded that word is. I can't think of anything more shocking this year, though, than the speech he gave at this year's Saturn Awards. Here's a show specifically designed to celebrate genre, a room filled with science fiction, fantasy, and horror filmmakers, and Tom Rothman gets up and not only lambasts everyone who writes about those genres, but also has the nerve to call himself a geek. You, sir, are no geek. A geek would not have strip-mined the Alien and Predator franchises the way you did. A geek would not consistently value release dates and fiscal quarters over getting the material right. Listening to him talk about what a friend he is to genre filmmakers was akin to being at a show of foundation dinner where the guest of honor was Joseph Goebbels. This is the guy who chased Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin off an ID4 sequel after they made $600 million for the studio because he wanted to pay them half of what they made on the first film. This is the man who browbeat Stephen Norrington until he quit the business altogether. This is the guy who almost convinced Alex Proyos to give up filmmaking. How many genre filmmakers, great genre filmmakers, do you see returning to Fox over and over to make their films? And why exactly do you think that is? If you're a Fox stockholder, now is the time to be concerned. X-Men is the only proven major franchise that Fox currently has up and running. Alien vs. Predator marked the end of two franchises at the same time. Star Wars was never yours in the first place. Studios depend on these type of films. There's a reason they're called tent poles. This is what you build the entire rest of your release year around. If you manage one of these properties the right way, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Moriarty continues. 
You know when Rothman finally gave the go-ahead to start putting together the treatment for X-Men 3? This February of 2005. I'm a chronic procrastinator, and even I think that's piss-poor time management, man. Continuing, Moriarty says, Here's the thing about X-Men. It may be one of the most flexible and durable film franchises I've ever seen. By the very nature of who the X-Men are, you can rotate cast in and out of the series without having to scrap continuity. This is already off to a better financial and creative start than the Bond franchise was, and you see the legs on that one. Why then would you allow a personal grudge to lead you to make decisions that will not only kill the Golden Goose, but also rape it and eat it? And make no mistake, the rush to make that Memorial Day 2006 release date is about beating Brian Singer to the screen. The acrimony involved in the Singer-Fox breakup is rich enough to write an entire book about, especially if it leads to the destruction of the franchise. This could turn into one of the all-time great displays of executive hubris in Hollywood. You want to know why you lost Singer to Warner Brothers and Superman in the first place? Because you took over a year to negotiate his deal to direct X-Men 3. That should have been one of the biggest no-brainer decisions you could have ever made. But maybe you have to have a brain to make a no-brainer decision. You strung him along and strung him along and strung him along and then when you had finally proven to him that you weren't going to make things easy, you were too late. Alan Horn took full advantage of Brian's almost fetishistic love of Donner Superman and your hesitancy, and he stole them from you. I don't know what's funnier, throwing Brian off the lot using security guards, or the fact that you had to let him back on the lot immediately thereafter so he could shoot house for the studio. Moriarty goes on to say, What's really amazing is how X-Men was something Rothman hated from the start, no matter what he says now in public. I've spoken to at least 10 people close to the production who have provided me with laundry lists of the ways that Rothman tried to fuck up the first film. Remember when they cut the budget and moved up the release date on the first X-Men? You know why? Rothman was cutting his losses. He really, truly anticipated that the film would come out and vanish without a trace, and he would finally be rid of what he saw as a corporate albatross. Instead, the film clicked, and on the second film, Brian Singer and his writers and the producers were all able to muster enough muscle to get Fox to give them the room they needed to make something even better. That must have stuck in Rothman's cross something fierce, and that's what led to that massive slowdown after X-Men 2. They should have made Brian's deal the following week, and they should have also locked in Doherty and Harris and Tom DeSanto and Lauren Schuler Donner and Ralph Winter and the entire production team and the cast and everyone else that was part of the creative alchemy that made the first two films work. I remember one year at BNAT when Tom DeSanto talked about the way that they had been planting the seeds of the Dark Phoenix storyline and several others since the very first scenes of the first X-Men. Who knows? Maybe someday Marvel will let DeSanto and Singer do a graphic novel or a limited run series where they do the story that they had in mind for X3 and X4 on the comics page so at least we can see where the films were originally headed. As it is, Rothman's firmly back in charge of the franchise now and that distaste for the material seems to be seeping back in. Moriarty concludes the open letter by stating, Forget the Sentinels, forget Magneto. It's Tom Rothman and his personal brotherhood, guys like Alex Young and Hutch Parker, who are poised to finally kill off Xavier students once and for all. X-Men 3 The Last Stand remains the financially most successful X-Men movie up until then, grossing $459 million worldwide. It did, however, receive a mixed response from critics and fans alike, and in the years since the movie's release, its standing among comic book movie fans has diminished even further. The only debate today is whether X-Men 3 or X-Men Origins Wolverine, also micromanaged by Rothman, is the worst X-Men movie of all time. Deadpool, the zany off-the-wall Marvel character created by Rob Liefeld, first appeared in a live-action movie in 2009's X-Men Origins Wolverine, an adaptation of the excellent Origin miniseries by Paul Jenkins, directed by Gavin Hood who had previously directed the excellent film Sotsi, and featuring the perfectly cast Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool, X-Men Origins Wolverine had all the ingredients in place for a great movie. But alas, 
It was overseen by Tom Rothman. Rothman and Hood clashed on the set, as director Gavin Hood wanted a darker, more brooding movie, while Rothman wanted a bright, fast-paced, child-friendly fare filled with money shots. In one particularly notorious incident, Tom Rothman is said to have repainted a whole set to make it more colorful and less brooding while director Gavin Hood was away for a few days. Things had gotten so bad that director Gavin Hood allegedly left the production, with the movie being finished by an unnamed ghost director. The unnamed ghost director is rumored to be Richard Donner, husband of producer Laura Schuler Donner. The finished movie performed moderately well, despite a work print being leaked online weeks before the movie's premiere. But like X3 before it, it was mauled by fans and critics alike, and represents a blight on the resume of everyone involved. Of all the character assassinations in that movie, none got it worse than Deadpool. It began promising enough. When we first see Wade Wilson before he becomes Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds portrays him just like he's supposed to be, the wisecracking merc with a mouth. When next we see him as Deadpool, or Barakapool as fans have dubbed him, the character is changed into the unrecognizable, a teleporting martial arts zombie with his signature mouth sewn shut. Fans were appalled by how Deadpool was handled, but held out hope that the character would be redeemed in the proverbial spin-off movie, which was put into development following X-Men Origins Wolverine. Evidently, fans weren't the only ones who had problems with the way Deadpool was portrayed. Producer Laura Lauren Schuler Donner stated that she wanted the Deadpool spin-off to ignore the events of X-Men Origins Wolverine and reboot the character closer to the comics. So much closer, in fact, that Deadpool's comic book ability to break the fourth wall would be preserved on film. Rhett Reese and Paul Warnick were hired to write the script in January of 2010, and in late October of that year, the script leaked online. The leaked script was lauded by those who read it for its fidelity to the source material and its balls-to-the-wall craziness. It was funny action-packed, and nailed the Deadpool character perfectly. But could such a movie ever be made by Fox on Tom Rothman's watch? Deadpool remained stuck in development hell for years. With the film apparently going nowhere, this left Deadpool's champion, superfan, and Lee Field's chosen man for the role, Ryan Reynolds, to take on other projects, including other comic book movie roles. With, of course, mixed results. In 2012, a proof of concept directed by Tim Miller was made showing Deadpool in action and what the tone of the finished movie might look like. Tom Rothman was not swayed, and the movie remained stuck in development hell. Tom Rothman's tight financial control and choice of projects were successful in that Fox never faced a single quarterly loss under his watch. Those practices allowed his tenure, what fans refer to now as Rothman's reign of terror, to last as long as it did. But all reigns must come to an end and so eventually did Rothman's. While not incurring any direct losses with Rothman running the ship, Fox did incur some indirect ones. While Rothman maintained a good relationship with Steven Spielberg, many other industry talents had problems with Rothman. DreamWorks CEO Jeffrey Katzenberg, as well as a whole host of other directors, made it clear they would never work for Fox again. According to The Hollywood Reporter, Rupert Murdoch himself personally warned Rothman that his autocratic style was harming morale at Fox. Furthermore, it had not gone unnoticed that Rothman opposed both Titanic and Avatar, which turned out to be two of the highest grossing movies of all time. And the summer of 2012 was a bad one for Fox. The Rothman greenlit movies, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter and The Watch both bombed, Prometheus underperformed, while Seth MacFarlane's Ted, a movie that Tom Rothman passed on and let slip from Fox's grasp, turned out to be a hit for Universal Studios. On September 14, 2012, Fox announced a restructuring which involved Rothman leaving his position at Fox effective January 1, 2013. He would later become an executive at Sony. But that's a story for another video. When Rothman's new position at Sony was announced, however, Rob Liefeld, creator of Deadpool, tweeted, Tom Rothman single-handedly kept Deadpool from getting made at Fox. Not a fan. Scratches Sony off the list. Back at Fox, Jim Giannopoulos stayed on. Where Rothman fought against both Titanic and Avatar, Giannopoulos supported them and was instrumental in both of them being made. It would appear he's more of a people person than Rothman, as it was Giannopoulos who brought Brian Singer back into the fold to continue the X-Men franchise, with X-Men Days of Future Past being designed specifically to undo the damage that Rothman had inflicted upon it. On July 28, 2014, the Deadpool proof of concept from 2012, the very same one that Tom Rothman had rejected, featuring the voice and motion capture performance of Ryan Reynolds, was leaked online. 
Unlike Rothman, the online and fan community went nuts at how good the footage was. Social media was on fire and the Fox inboxes were flooded. In September of 2014, the long-awaited Deadpool movie was announced and slated for release on February 12, 2016. In an interview with Slash Film, Ryan Reynolds made it clear that the reaction to the leaked footage was exclusively the reason why the movie was greenlit. In more recent interviews, Reynolds has further elaborated that the response was so overwhelming that while it wouldn't be announced right away, the movie was internally greenlit at Fox within 24 hours of the leak. Simon Kinberg, a huge supporter of Deadpool according to Leefield, added that unlike fan stick Deadpool will be part of the shared Fox Marvel X-Men universe. While fan stick is evidence that the controlling culture remains alive and well at Fox, Deadpool is one where the higher-ups seemingly agreed to look the other way while the filmmakers work their magic. As Deadpool is rumored to have a production budget of only $50 million, very modest for a Marvel-branded movie, the Fox producers could afford to not only look the other way, but to allow the movie the luxury of an R rating and its off-the-wall marketing. Check back for Andre's review of Deadpool and further analysis on how that worked out here at Midnight's Edge. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit subscribe so you can catch all of our upcoming videos. For more podcasts, news, and reviews, check us out at MidnightsEdge.net and follow us on Twitter at Midnight's Edge. Also check out our Facebook group at Facebook.com slash groups slash Midnight's Edge.